I'm Steve Sawyer, so I'm the director of a data band, uh, and my colleague here, Eric. Uh, today we're gonna talk to you about a product management perspective on data observability, and then specifically give you a, a demonstration of data band. So when you think about data observability um, from a product perspective, you know, why would IBM go out and actually, you know, go buy a data observability uh, company? And, and really, it really comes around creating products that are differentiated. That's the things that you guys are focused on, it's things that IBM is focused on. So we actually needed a data observability tool within IBM. Um, and so we actually bought data band specifically for that. Our own CIO uses it. Uh, you know, really, it's because when you think about creating differentiated products and bringing those differentiated products to market, you know, it's about having a unique design and you can go win uh, you know, market share based off of the design. You know, you can have differentiation based off of, you know, distribution, how you actually move things into market faster, or, or ultimately it's data. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this particular, you know, conference and being here with Airflow is more and more distribution and data are one and the same thing, right? Like how you actually think about distribution is really just another source of data for you. Now here I'm wearing like a Watson X t-shirt and like IBM, like where's the AI, right? Like it's, it's not my like differentiation based off of the AI. The AI. Um, and I'll actually like, you know, turn it over to something that our head of research, Dario, actually mentioned at, at Think this year. And the reality is, you know, the differentiation in AI is actually differentiation in the data itself. You know, when you look at the models that exist today in the world, you know, they're built on all of the public data that's been out there. And remember how well that kind of went when it started, right? Those first set of models built on that data, like, were terrible, right? They had hate, abuse, and profanity. Like, you know, really getting those models to perform well cost millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, actually, uh, for these companies, you know, to go in and, like, refine that data in a way that you could train a model that now gives you something, you know, the quality of ChatGTP. So when you think about, like, data at that level, and you realize the fact that my differentiation is built on data, my differentiation is built, um, how much of that data has actually made it into the enterprise, like, or from the enterprise into models? Almost none of it. So as a result, right, you know, Data observability is essential. It's essential to how you actually build better products. And, and what we're seeing when we talk to, to CEOs, CIOs, is they don't actually trust the data, right? They don't actually even trust the data in their enterprise to put into these models, to put into their workflows. Um, you know, they don't trust it. Like, they have data quality issues associated with it. Um, and at its core, like, they don't trust their data pipelines. And so, so IBM bought, you know, DataBand to really give observability into those data pipelines so we can make better decisions throughout that process and ultimately build better products. Because, like, what is a product about? It's about an experience. So, you know, if you, if you stop by the booth, you know, you'll see we have, you know, these little, uh, you know, uh, cars. Uh, and I really think cars are kind of a unique way of, of talking about the analogy of, of data observability and data ban, you know, it's because it does give you, you know, a product experience. So, you know, it's one thing is to, to have the, the final thing, you know, but it's another thing to actually build it and actually operate the car and, and what do you do, like, to keep the car on the track? And that's really where, where data ban comes in, is you just run into to issues, you know, all over the place. Right? You know, you have, you know, issues with your tires, issues with your engines, issue with the transmission, right? So it's not just about the, the data on your dashboard that, that's coming into the drivers. It's about fixing these issues and, and, and really pulling it together uh, no matter where it comes from in the vehicle. And that's what data band is giving you. It's essentially solving the problem of, you know, where is the issue? You know, how severe is it? And then, you know, lastly, what do I have to go do to go fix it? So you can get the car back on the road, so you can get back to delivering the best products. So again, focusing on that data quality and pulling it together. So 
that's what IBM gives you, uh, DataBand gives you, right, is the, essentially the power to deliver, you know, reliable and trustworthy data. So we really focus on three main things when focusing, like, uh, when delivering uh, data observability, you know, uh, you know, the first one is detecting those issues earlier. This is particularly important for when you're dealing with like RAG workflows or you're dealing with ML flows, um, where like any sort of you know uh, issue in that data cleansing or even in data ingest, um, if you're not detected early, you actually can run into major implications in terms of your application performance uh, on the back end especially if you start polluting like vector databases, uh, things can get very ugly in terms of your, your ML performance. Um, you know, secondly, you know, making sure that that data is trusted. So you know, when you do have data problems, which occur, right, how do you actually resolve them quicker? And then, of course, you know, uh, resolving them faster. So getting that you know, issue into the hands of the right person so they can actually resolve it. Now, before DataBand, the way that you had to do, do that is you had to go into every single one of those components uh, of your car, of your data pipeline, and actually go figure out where the problem was, right? Like that troubleshooting was very manually intensive um, and, you know, just ripe with errors. With DataBand, you know, we actually bring together all of the ways of, of pulling all of that data together from all of those different components, so, you know, you actually have the most visibility, and then you can respond faster. So, so that's ultimately what we have built, and, and what's really exciting is we actually have, you know, our partners are actually taking this, and then taking this observability, and, and now building it into the way that they operate, because they're seeing that higher performance they can get uh, from their products in operations uh, when using DataBand. So with that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to, to uh, Eric for the, uh, the rest of the time to actually, you know, take you a tour of the product so you can actually experience all the different components uh, of DataBand. Um, so uh, here you go, Eric. Yeah. All right, well, uh, Steve's getting set up. I'll just uh, quick enter. I'm Eric Jones. I'm one of the product managers from DataBand. Uh, these demos, I usually do these in about 45 minutes or more. Uh, so I'll try to keep this one, uh, I'll give you the high level overview and try to get everyone out of here in time for lunch. All right, so yeah, I'm just gonna walk through high level what DataBand is, how it works, uh, specifically in this context with Airflow. So uh, I'll go through some examples of um, uh, a typical pipeline that we might see from our customers and how DataBand brings metadata from a lot of different places under one roof. So I'm um, actually gonna start from just the concept of uh, integrations in general. So DataBand is primarily focused uh, on pipeline observability. Uh, our integrations are primarily set up through our UI, through wizards that are very easy to get through. In some cases, you might use our SDK, like with uh, Python or PySpark or Scala. Uh, but for the, the sake of Airflow, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're connecting to your Airflow cluster. Uh, we're uh, basically, there's, there's three things required there. We've got uh, our Python library. We've got a monitor DAG that you'll run on your cluster. Uh, and then we have a... Um, connection that you'll set up within your, your, your admin connection settings, which will just basically say this is my DataBand URL and this is uh, my access token. Uh, and once we have all that information, at that point our library and our monitor DAG are going to essentially push that metadata to DataBand. Uh, we're not necessarily pulling anything. Uh, our integrations vary in terms of, uh, for the most part, most of them are more of a pool where we connect to uh, some sort of source system API. Uh, but in the case of Airflow, we are pushing that metadata uh, straight from the Airflow cluster. So uh, in terms of getting up and running, uh, it's literally less than five minutes, assuming you don't have the, the typical uh, roadblocks in terms of, um, you know, like CI, CD approvals to get like a, a library added to your requirements file or get a connection added in Airflow. And yeah, so uh, we can get up and running with an Airflow cluster very quickly. Uh, and that enables us to monitor all the DAGs that are running on that cluster. Um, and, you know, we have plenty of customers that are certainly monitoring, you know, 10 plus clusters in a single environment. Uh, and we have plenty of tools that'll let you kind of slice and dice these DAGs within DataBand so that you can, uh, you know, use the appropriate RBAC to ensure that only the, the right teams are seeing uh, the right clusters and whatnot. So uh, from our pipeline screen here, what we're looking at is uh, basically all the systems that are being monitored in this DataBand environment. 
Um, and again, this is a data band's not limited to just um, Airflow. We, we integrate with a lot of the modern data tools like uh, Azure Data Factory, DBT, uh, Spark, as well as like some of the, the uh, other big players like traditional tools like Data Stage, uh, Control M now, uh, and a few more that are in the pipeline as well. Uh, so starting here at this top level, uh, what we're seeing here is basically all of our pipelines that are being monitored by Databand. Uh, we've got this high level overview of uh, pipeline names, project tags, which are something that you can do through the DAG definition and just adds an extra level of uh, being able to slice these things and assign them uh, in terms of RBAC to the different groups that you have within your environment. Um, run states over time, and this is since the point that Databand started observing these pipelines. Uh, any alert definitions that might be set up, which I'll cover that uh, in more detail later. Uh, and then any information about alerts that are still outstanding for these pipelines. So once we drill down from this top level, from uh, any given DAG, what we're now looking at is, uh, are the, the individual runs of this pipeline. Uh, so here, this is pretty much gonna be one-to-one -one with what you would see in Airflow in terms of uh, looking at your, your, your runs list. Uh, we're providing the same type of information that we do at the top level. Um, but at, at this point, we're, we're not just reporting on things like the overall pipeline state. Uh, we're looking down at the task level now. Uh, and then once we get one level deeper, uh, this is where we will uh, begin to show uh, the specific information for uh, this run within Databand. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the, the, the run overview screen. Uh, so this is what you'll be greeted with uh, every time you drill into a particular run within Databand. Uh, over here on the, the right side, we have you know, the traditional DAG view that you've come to know within Airflow. Uh, this is gonna look almost identical to that. Uh, and we'll have the same look and feel regardless of what that pipeline technology is that we're integrating with. Uh, we can see some high level information here like the overall state of the pipeline, uh, the overall duration of the pipeline, as well as that information about the individual tasks as well. Over here on the left is where we uh, are gonna show all the information that we've collected from Airflow uh, or whatever tool it is that we're looking at. So this could include things like uh, the duration, uh, the run duration trend over time, which can help you uh, identify some cases maybe where there are outliers and there are certainly ways that we can uh, alert on this to, to streamline the process of notifying your teams when maybe things are starting to run a little bit longer than we've seen historically. Uh, we've got some information about task level durations. Uh, of course, any parameters that we've uh, collected from Airflow, we're showing those here so that you can quickly see maybe like if you've got a certain parameter that could affect how this DAG runs, you can see exactly what that parameter was that uh, executed today. Uh, going across the top, we're looking at the metrics uh, that we have collected from all the source systems. Uh, and uh, if, as you see here, we have uh, a few different categories of metrics, but um, overall, everything that Databand is collecting in terms of metadata is coming through in the form of a metric. And you, you can see here that we've got 538 metrics for what is a pretty small DAG. I mean, we're talking five or six tasks uh, total. Uh, but this is uh, really the jumping off point, which is going to empower all of the alerting uh, that you can do within Databand. So you'll see a variety of metrics here uh, from uh, the pipeline level, so things like the states, durations for both the pipeline and the task. Uh, you'll also th see things at the data set level, which might include schemas, uh, record counts, and it could even in some cases include uh, column level statistics if you're doing things like profiling data frames. Uh, as I click across the top, uh, we're still, uh, excuse me, uh, we're, we're, what we're doing now is we're showing the logs that have been collected, and uh, one of the important things to point out here is that, um, you know, a lot of our customers are not simply integrating with only Airflow. What they're doing is they're integrating with other tools that uh, obviously Airflow is orchestrating. Uh, so in our example here, we have this Airflow pipeline that's uh, ingesting some data. It is uh, kicking off uh, some DBT jobs, so running some models, running some tests. Uh, and then we've got a summary of our data at the end, which is running in Python, but more commonly, this is gonna be something like PySpark or Scala, which the look and feel is gonna uh, be all the same. But the nice thing here is that uh, as I click through these tasks, I can see the logs from each of these individual uh, systems that we might be monitoring. So if I click through over here to uh, you know, a, a, a DBT task, um, now we are seeing the logs from DBT. This is exactly what you would see if you, uh, you know, checked your DBT core logs or you're a DBT cloud user, you could see that here. Uh, for our Python task, we can see the uh, Python logs. So th this is what really helps us to bring everything together under one roof and give that 
that consolidated view of uh, everything without requiring you to jump around from one system to the next. Uh, and so finally, getting down to the level of the data set, uh, this is where uh, we, we start to show the other side of the picture. So, so far, we've, we've mostly been talking about the concept of pipeline health and pipeline monitoring, uh, but in a lot of cases, we can do things beyond that in terms of data sets. Uh, so some examples of that might be DBT tests. Uh, these are very commonly used by our customers. Uh, it's very easy to hop into here to see exactly which tests ran, to see how many failures there were, and I can easily jump into an alert definition from any of these. Uh, I can track some of these values over time to see trends with uh, any metric that exists over here that's numerical. Uh, and then uh, one of the really interesting things is um, when you start to use um, our SDK, so our Python SDK or our Java SDK to integrate with things like Python or PySpark or Scala, um, so what we can do here is we can uh, essentially wrap around your data frames and do some profiling. Uh, at, at the highest level, this profiling, regardless of whether this is Spark or some other ETL tool that does all the heavy lifting itself, like ADF or data stage, um, at, at that high level, we're almost always going to show a, a few things. So the type of data set, so in this case, Snowflake, uh, the data set path, so this is what becomes the unique identifier for this data set in DataBand. Uh, and I'll show our data set repository um, in just a few minutes. Uh, and then we can see the, the operation type, which is gonna either be a read or a write. Uh, and, and that's one thing that's uh, kind of unique about DataBand in terms of uh, looking more so at data in motion versus like the traditional data quality view of looking at um, you know, the data once it's reached the warehouse and you know, maybe it's been several hours since the first pipeline kicked off. Uh, we can intercept this information as this data uh, is being processed. And so we look at things in terms of operations. So you know, at, at the end of the day, you've got some table that's being loaded, say in Snowflake, but leading up to that, you've got a series of reads and writes that are happening from one task to the next. Uh, and that's what we can uh, capture and present that information. Um, and so uh, alongside that, we've got things like the, the shape of our data frame. We've got the record count over time, where you can, again, kind of at a quick glance, see the trends here. And, of course, this is something that you can alert on just the same as any other metric. Um, in some cases, you can even see data previews uh, within DataBand. Uh, I'll say that this is something that is uh, generally off by default just because most people don't like the idea of data leaving their uh, data platform, uh, but it's something that's uh, available if it's uh, something that you're interested in. We, we do have some customers that like to see this information as like a quick sanity check of what's going on. Uh, and then lastly, we've got um, our schema view. And so what we're doing here is um, kind of twofold. So uh, regardless of the, the data set type or the, the technology that we're looking at, uh, we're, we'll generally pull in the schema of each of these data set operations, uh, which is gonna include the names, the field types. Um, and this is going to obviously uh, enable alerting for things like schema changes. Uh, but in the case of our SDK, which we've used here, so you know, like I said, for something like Spark, uh, what we can do is uh, profile our data frames as they are loaded into memory. Uh, and what this will allow us to do is capture a lot of you know, rich metrics around each of your columns. Uh, obviously, there's considerations here if you've got a, a very wide uh, data frame or like you know, billions of records. Uh, but there's, there's ways you can limit this in terms of sampling or only uh, selecting um, you know, a, a subset of columns. But what you'll see in here is if I, I drill into some column uh, here, so our data that we're looking at is from the city of New York. Uh, this is the uh, 311 data set, which I'm sure everyone's done a project with this data set at some point or another. It's a great data set that's publicly available. Uh, what we're looking at here is basically people are filing complaints with the city of New York and saying that you know, there's a lot of noise here, there's a pothole on this street. Uh, so one of the things that this team might be interested in is how long does it take to close these service requests after they've been opened. And so what we can look at through DataBand now is as we, we're processing this data set and we're loading it into memory, we can profile it and we can get some information of, uh, uh, for things like, you know, obviously record count, but also things like mean time uh, or, or mean value. So, you know, on average, it looks like uh, we're closing our service requests in about 1.7 days, which seems good to me, but maybe it's not, I don't know. Uh, standard deviation, distinct count, nulls, uh, min and max, you know, so on and so forth. And each of these, as I click through them, we've got the uh, trend over the last 15 or so runs. And what you'll see here with the, the green area uh, surrounding the graph is actually the 
uh, anomaly range, which um, although you can enable anomaly detection type alerts through data band manually, we're generally running some sort of anomaly detection behind the scenes in all cases. And what this is gonna tell us is that you know, every time this pipeline runs, we look at the last X number of runs, we say that, okay, based on that data, a reasonable expectation for today's metric is going to be between this value and this value, which is what's represented here by the green area. And so then anything that falls outside that green area, which if I can, yep, here's some examples. So our null percentage, it looks like it dropped a little bit um, over these two days here, which null percentage going down seems like a good thing, but uh, maybe it's alarming for whatever reason. E either way, it's an anomaly. So this is the type of thing that you could uh, alert on. So. Uh, you know, although you have the option of uh, doing the traditional hard-coded alerts that say, tell me if such and such value is greater than or less than or equal to, you can have this anomaly detection that's a little more of a set it and forget it uh, type situation. So uh, with that being said, I'll uh, just quickly show the data set screen. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that all this information is being compiled uh, into our data set repo. Uh, and so this is what's going to allow you to kind of see all the data sets that have been processed um, as uh, during the course of your pipelines. And I'll actually drill into one of these from the example we were just looking at. And what this is gonna show me is uh, for this particular data set, I can see my, uh, my schema here. I can see how many records this table has over time because I am also monitoring this table with our Snowflake monitor, which that's where this information's coming from. And then I can see things like how many records are being written or read to this, uh, to this data set on a daily basis, how many you know, raw operations are there, so how many total reads and writes. Uh, that's what I'll be able to see here. Uh, I can drill into the history uh, of this data set, um, and I can see some information about all the, uh, all the operations that have happened against this data set, regardless of what that system is. Uh, and this will show me, you know, if it's like a Snowflake query, it might show me the, the transaction ID from Snowflake. Otherwise, it's probably gonna show me something like a pipeline name, which I can jump straight into these runs from here. Uh, and then lastly, if you're doing those column level statistics, what you can do is uh, you know, drill into a specific operation and then you can start to see uh, some of these data quality trends over time for that data that's in motion. Uh, and so lastly, what I'll uh, cover here in the last few minutes is the alerting component, because this is, this is where the value comes in, because you know, it's nice to detect issues, but if we're not alerting people, then they're not, they're not aware that something needs to be fixed, they're not taking action. So we do that through our alerts. Uh, so one thing to point out uh, first is that all of our alerts can be routed to various receivers. Uh, this includes things like Slack, Teams, PagerDuty, email, uh, custom webhooks, and we're always adding more here. It's generally pretty easy for us to add these. Uh, but the idea here is that you create receivers and alert definitions get paired with receivers. An alert definition can have uh, more than one receiver, certainly. It depends on you know, who needs to see this information, uh, which teams or which individuals are responsible for fixing it. So try to reduce uh, alert fatigue in that sense by not you know, dumping everything into a central channel because that's when people start to get that alert fatigue. Like I said, things get too noisy and they start to ignore these alerts. So we wanna make sure that you're only seeing what you need to see. Um, so beyond that, uh, in terms of the alerts themselves, uh, just a quick run through. Um, you know, we've uh, talked a lot today about the concept of pipeline monitoring versus data monitoring. So that's generally how our uh, alert definitions are broken down here. Um, we, we, at the pipeline level, we've got things like pipeline state. So did my pipeline fail? Obviously, that's going to be probably our biggest alert definition that we see from our customers. But we do see some cases where people are even alerting on other cases outside of failure, like. Uh, I've seen cases where customers will want to alert when a pipeline starts running, uh, just to have that you know, kind of peace of mind that it's, it's running. Uh, pipeline duration, uh, obviously this is going to be big with anomaly detection and making sure that things are not trending in a wrong direction. Uh, DBT test failures, schema change alerts, uh, pipeline SLAs, so this is, you know, give us a cron expression and tell us this pipeline should start by a certain time each day or complete by a certain time each day, and then we can alert you when that SLA is not met. Um, a lot of the same stuff for tasks, and then at the data set level, we can do things like data SLA alerts, so same concept of I've got this table, it should be updated by a certain time each day, and so an update could be something like a write coming in from, say, Spark, or it could be like an update operation from Snowflake. Uh, we'll capture that information here and uh, allow you to, to set the same type of SLAs. 
Um, data quality alerts, so all those data quality checks or metrics that I was showing previously, uh, you can alert on those here. And then I'll uh, just quickly show with my last few minutes an example of one of our alert types. So this is uh, what you're going to see when this actually fires. Uh, so you know, imagine that you've got some pipeline that failed. I've got uh, an alert receiver set up to send this information to say Slack. So in Slack, you're gonna see some high level info like what is the alert type, what's, what's the pipeline name, when did this happen, what's the trigger value. Um, but then the, the main thing that our users are going to take from that is gonna be this link that brings them to this uh, alert detail screen. And from this alert detail screen, this is where you really jump off your investigation of um, what went wrong and you can start to debug this, uh, this wh whatever issue it may be. So um, on the right here, you know, in the case of a failure, one of the most important things you wanna know is what was the error message. Uh, here, we're highlighting this pretty easily to uh, interpret. We've got an AWS token that expired. It's very actionable information for uh, a data engineer and quick to fix. Maybe it's not so clear and you wanna look at the more complete logs. You have that capability as well. Uh, and then over here on the left, we have this impact analysis. So uh, I, I talked about the concept of uh, data set paths being the unique identifier for a data set and data band. And what this uh, allows us to do is we can start to look at data sets and say, are there any cases where some data set gets you know, written by one task or one pipeline and then ingested by a subsequent pipeline? And when that happens, we can infer uh, lineage from that, and so we can show that within the context of an alert. So in this case, what we're saying is, hey, this pipeline failed as a result of this. Uh, we have some data sets that are potentially at risk. We have some downstream pipelines that are potentially at risk. We have some operations that didn't run today that we've come to expect from observing this pipeline in the past. And then we've got uh, a more of a traditional lineage view here. So uh, what we can see is, uh, you know, here's the, the, the pipeline itself. So we've got our tasks in Airflow. Uh, we see the inputs and outputs of each task. I can see here that this task typically outputs these three data sets. Since it failed today, these data sets weren't produced. And so we're calling that out as an issue. And then we've got the view of uh, downstream pipelines. So this is where we'll take that information and we'll start to look for those relationships across pipelines and we'll say that you know, this pipeline failed, it outputs a file that's used by another pipeline which outputs a file that's used by another pipeline, so on and so forth. So this failure is maybe affecting five or more pipelines downstream. Um, so yeah, that's the information that we, we show here and so uh, ideally we're, we're, we're giving you all the information you need to debug this issue. Um, and uh, if not, we, we're providing a lot of convenient ways to jump from, from this over to the source system. So, you know, I can, uh, I'm not gonna click it now, but I could jump over to Airflow, like right to this DAG run if I wanted to. So one of the pieces of feedback we receive from engineers a lot is, you know, I manage 10 plus Airflow clusters. If something happens, I gotta go find out which cluster it is, get the credentials, so on and so forth. We can take you right to that run because we, we have that URL, we've built that out for you based on the integration you set up. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap it up.